Hey Last Looks crew, how is everyone getting on? I'm not sure what to say in this intro. I am days away from finishing a very demanding job and looking forward to getting home to my husband and dogs. I am tired. So I will keep this brief. The incredible Naomi Don is the guest in this rerun episode of the podcast. And if you have had the pleasure of meeting or working with Naomi, you know she is a wonderful human being and a fabulously talented artist. So please enjoy this insightful chat into her work and career journey. Now for a quick moment to thank the Last Looks crew that leave awesome reviews. And here are a couple that made me smile. Erica wrote, I never can get enough of listening to everyone's journey. It's so motivating and inspiring. So many different stories and everyone's path is so different. I can't tell you how many movies I've watched after hearing them talk about it. The Oscars specials are great too. I love watching and listening or vice versa. You really get a different way of seeing the talents. And this one from AKS Makeup 14. I've been a special effects makeup artist in IARTSY for four great years. I got in the union when I was 22 and I wanted this to be my career since I was 14. I wish so badly this podcast existed back when I was a kid, but I'm so happy that this platform exists for young people that want to pursue a career in hair and makeup in film and television. Every episode is so informative and inspiring and Jamie is an excellent host. Thanks. (laughs) <laughs> a great podcast for people in every stage of our industry. So remember, guys, if you write a review, send me a screenshot and your postal address, and I will send you a fun Last Look sticker bundle. So what are my plans once I wrap this current project, you ask or don't ask? Either way, I'm telling you. Well, the usual catching up with important life stuff, but also as far as Last Looks is concerned, I will be prepping the next season doing more on-camera interviews so you have the option to watch the episodes on YouTube. Hope to finally launch the Last Looks Continuity app we have been working on for way, way too long. Making an app isn't easy, guys. And I will also get the Last Looks workshops up online. So no matter where you are in the world, you'll be able to have access to what I teach in my Respect the Wig workshop in LA. But you'll be able to learn along with me in the comfort of your own home and at your own pace. Woohoo! Funnily enough, I'm doing all these things and I truly have no idea if any of you are remotely interested in any of it. Such a weird disconnect. So if you have an opinion or you are excited about what I have coming up, throw a DM my way and let me know. And remember, if you'd like to show your support for the podcast, share it with friends and colleagues. And you can always buy the podcast a coffee. Link for everything is in the show notes of this episode or on the website last-looks.com. Okay, I will hush now and let us get back to the reason we are here. My name is Jamie Lee, a hairstylist working in film, and this is the Last Looks podcast, a show where I catch up with hair and makeup artists working in the film industry around the world. And today on this rerun episode, I'm chatting with hair and makeup artist Naomi Don. On with the show. And now, our feature presentation. Pictures up. Last looks. Rolling. And action. Welcome to the Last Looks podcast, Naomi. Thank you very much. Hey, now I would like you to finish the sentence for me, okay? Right. Once upon a time, there was a girl named Naomi, and when she grew up, she wanted to be... Oh, dear. <laughs> what? A makeup artist. I should desperately. (laughs) Oh, well, there you go. That's easy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So how did you make that happen? Uh, Well, actually, I got hit by a thunderbolt when I was about 17 and Mm -hmm. wondering what to do on my way to art college about really what did I want to do at the end of that. And I, I got hit by this idea that someone was doing, was painting the monsters on Doctor Who. Mm. And so it was that a job? You know, this was a long time ago. This was in the late seventies when mm-hmm. makeup artists were not celebs and they weren't very high profile. And I didn't even know if it was a job at all. So I just thought someone must be doing that. So my mum 
rang the BBC and they said, yes, it was a job. And they gave a list of qualifications that you needed. So I sort of did an about turn and I got into the London College of Fashion Hmm. and studied. I did their three-year course, which was then a sort of sitting guilds. It was a sort of craft trade type course in hairdressing, beauty therapy, cosmetic science. It was very, very comprehensive three-year course, which is now a degree course, in fact, because now it's a university. But so... And I went there purely because I wanted to get into the BBC. Mm-hmm. So I did the course and I got into the BBC just before I finished the course. They were advertising for the makeup school at the BBC mm-hmm. and I applied and I went and begged really. I begged everywhere and I got in. I got into the BBC and there you did another two years training. You're a trainee for another two years and you have sort of started off washing puffs and sponges and getting cups mm-hmm. of tea for the makeup designers, things like like that. And oh, yeah. eventually, you know, you were allowed to touch a face, but it took ages. And the first face I made up was Neil Kinnock. And mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh and then it went from there, really. And and in the end, the BBC makeup school was the most incredible training. And working at the BBC gave me the experience, which coupled with a three-year course at the London College of Fashion, I was, we were all of us so highly trained at that point. We were trained in everything. And really that gave us all the confidence to go out into the world and leave the BBC eventually, become freelance and go out and do our stuff. And, and that's what it was. It was all about the training. That's awesome. So just having that foundation is so amazing. Yeah. And so yeah. within the BBC, I, I'm guessing, well, that's quite a variety of work really, isn't it? Because, I mean, the BBC is putting out all, all sorts of shows. Yeah, particularly in those days. Now it's different now because very little is made in-house, but then everything was made in-house. So you were doing period dramas, Shakespeare's, you were, you were doing sitcoms or sketch shows or the news or anything films you could have been doing anything and we did and so that's how we got so much experience and in between when you weren't on a major project you were standing by you had to go into work and you had to stand by and then you could use that time the the designers would come down and say does anyone want me help with anything so you could really brush up on your on anything you needed help with so you're constantly honing your craft and really improving yourself you had all these incredible opportunities and then so it was great doesn't exist anymore the bbc no, training so it's sad. such a shame it's such a shame but we were really privileged to have that and a lot of the big makeup designs jenny shurkor uh, francis hannan all of that we all came out of the bbc that's wonderful so yeah. at what point did you feel that it was time to move on well they wouldn't promote me to designer i'd been there six, seven years, and they wouldn't promote me because they said my personality wasn't very BBC. I was very gregarious, and and I thought, come on, blimey. (laughs) And I didn't think that. It was much more graphic than that, but I better not say. And at that point, I'd been working with Tracy Allman on a sketch show, and she had a very big music career, and she was going around the world promoting her singles and she said did I want to go with her and do her hair and makeup and I and that was the opportunity I'd been waiting for it was, it was a job that lasted a few months it gave me a sort of really good start and I said yep yeah. and out I was out of that door and then I went and did all the went all over the place with Tracy and then she did a film for the BBC and then the producer of that film asked me to do a feature film and, and on that feature film I met Timothy Dalton. Oh, wow. And I, so I did that film. It was a period film called The Doctor and the Devils. And then mm-hmm. I was working with a comic strip, which were Jennifer Saunders and Dawn French and Rick Mann and Ada and Edmondson. Oh, my God. We were, doing, <laughs> <laughs> so we were doing like these comic strip films for Channel 4. And then suddenly this headline broke that Timothy Dalton was the next Bond. And I I had only done one one film, and for a joke, I said to Jen or someone, I said, "Cure, sure, wouldn't it be great if Tim rang and asked me to be his personal makeup artist on Bond?" <laughs> and that night, the phone rang, and it was the producer saying, "Could you come in? Tim's requested you 
to be his makeup artist, could you come in for an interview? And I nearly passed out. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> That's it very was kind so of out of my realm of what I thought might happen in my career. And I never thought about doing films. I only wanted to do Doctor Who. That was it. <laughs> and, and then I love it. I went for my interview and they offered me a job and I couldn't believe it. Bond is my second film and the BBC wouldn't let me be a designer. So there you go. There you know, <laughs> <laughs> I love how you said it out loud as a joke, <laughs> but I'm sure it was probably only a partial joke. There's somewhere no, inside you that probably thought I, that would be I ne- No, I never <laughs> no. even thought. I mean, when you do a Bond, it's really the most phenomenal job. It's, you know, it's a huge job and you don't think at 20, whatever I was then, then and I had only done one feature film. You don't think your know, next feature film is going to be a Bond. So, mm. so I, I really did say it as a joke, um, but somehow it happened. And so I really have Tim Dalton to thank for my career because once you've done a Bond, you're sort of, even though the, the work isn't necessarily the most demanding work, it, sometimes it has been lately, but mm. it's it just sets you in a whole different place. And that really was the beginning of my feature film career. And that's really all down to Tim Dalton. Wow, that's very cool. So, w- what was your position? You were I was, I was his personal makeup artist. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, and it it wasn't I wasn't even allowed to do his hair because then in England, hair and makeup were two separate jobs, and they were very very strict. Ah, so I wasn't allowed to do his hair. So all I had to do was powder his neck, ma- well, make him up, and it was I mean, it was months of work making up Tim Dalton, but and it wasn't very demanding because he was gorgeous. Yeah, and you know, like occasionally him. he'd get a wound, and that's all. And that's all I had to do. But after that, the next bond I did, I I think I chiefed it with Norma okay. Webb, and uh, so it got a bit, and that was more, much more exciting. That's awesome. So, how many have you done now? I've done five, and oh, wow. the last one I did was Spectre. Uh, with I did the last two with Sam Mendes, and Spectre was fantastic. I mean it. Doing a Bond is fantastic. It's the best, best job of all in so many ways. You know, they're incredible people to work for. It's really like a family in, in the real sense and you have a lot of creative freedom and you feel very supported. They're really fantastic people to work for. It's amazing. I wonder how they've managed to keep that kind of, I don't know, that that Bond feel throughout the years. You know what I mean? Just as a Bond family, I suppose it just. Well, I think it, really it's Barbara Broccoli who took over from her dad when he died, okay. and her and her brother Michael Wilson really have kept it going, and that's how they've maintained it. They have huge respect for their crew and the actors that they employ and the directors. They give total freedom to, and um, yet maintaining the sort of franchise, but always letting it change and be and grow and move with the times it's really yeah it's it's really really great that's awesome I need to go backwards a little bit because you kind of made my mind melt a little bit when you mentioned all the comedy oh the comic strip yeah oh my god (laughs) did you Um, you watch the comic strips because you might be too young no, I don't. I don't know. I haven't. But of course, I know all the actors that you're just talking about because yeah. I watched other other things. I mean, um, of course, French and Saunders and and that type of thing. But also, um, absolutely, as a child, and probably shouldn't have been watching it, but addicted to the young ones, like yeah, well, on you know. repeat. There was yeah. a point where my mum was like, "Okay, we need to stop watching this now because I think you're turning into Vivian." <laughs> attitude is yeah, I don't know why you've taken on Vivian but this is what's happening so we're gonna put that VHS away for a minute and yeah. you're gonna go and watch something yeah I would probably have done from <laughs> my daughter <laughs> but yeah so how much fun was that oh it was it was an incredible time because when we when we did those comic strips they were one hour films for channel four and Peter Richardson wrote and directed them, and it, it was sort of anarchic filmmaking in a way. And we we had the most incredible touring, and no one was. I mean, the young ones were really groundbreaking, and so were the comic strips. They they just did stuff no one had ever done before, mm. and so it was incredible fun. And we were all really young, not hugely experienced, but we got through these 
huge makeups and character things. And we had amazing actors coming in, and it was really good fun. It was it it's very different and exhausting, and but great, really great. I felt so very awesome. lucky to have been part of that actually, and yeah. we're still still very good friends with Dawn and Jen and and Aid. And I did 300 Years of French and Saunders a couple of Christmases ago. It was their Christmas special. It was the last one they did for the uh, last show. And I, I did Dawn on it. And we had a ridiculous time. It was just brilliant. Oh, so much fun. Brilliant. Yeah. It's so great to have made those relationships. And, oh, just. They're very strong relationships, those, because we've, we've been friends now for 35 years or something more. Yeah. And. And we've maintained those friendships and there's something fantastic about that. And also Tracy, I saw Tracy in LA when I was there recently. And, you know, it's just great to have a history, such a long history of people. Absolutely. I, I met Tracy very briefly on Mrs. America. I just went up to um, Toronto for a couple of weeks to help out and it was while she was there. Yeah. And God, I loved watching her on that. It's oh, yeah. so good. She's so good. She's brilliant. I know. She's yeah. very, very clever. She's she's pretty great. Pretty fantastic girl. So you've also been a personal for quite a few actors, like Michelle Pfeiffer, yeah. Melanie Griffiths, Ben Stiller. What does being a personal mean to you? Like what do you think artists should remember when they're in that position? Well, it means lots of different things. It means you're going in with a major act. You, it has to be a major actor to have the sort of control over who does their makeup to that extent mm -hmm. that they can have their own makeup artist. So I think, first of all, I go in and you have to remember you're becoming part of a film that somebody else is designing. So mm -hmm. it's very, for me, it's very important to approach the designer and see what they need or what they want or how they want everybody to look so that whatever I create is in that world with them. Otherwise, it would look ridiculous if you have an actor who's looking completely different to the rest of the film. Oh. You're not. I mean, we're all there to tell a story, and that story needs to have some coherence. So that's the first thing you have to remember. And it's not as specific as saying, well, I'd like Michelle to wear blue eyeshadow and coral lipstick. It's not that mm. at all. It's, it's just it, staying in that world. So, for instance, I just... I just did Emma Thompson. I was working with Emma Thompson doing her hair and makeup for Cruella, okay. which Nadia wow. Stacey was designing, who did the favourite. And, mm -hmm. and so I called her and I said, you know, to say hello and what was she thinking? And she sent me a load of reference that the director had had for Emma, which was great because she wasn't saying do this. But she was giving me a world that I could design in. And some of it I did do, actually, because her reference was phenomenally good. But from that, I could start doing my own reference and pulling up images. But all of that, I ran by her. I ran by Nadia before I started working on them because they were quite out there. Mm. The looks I did on Emma were quite extreme. And so I wanted to make sure that that worked. And she was fine with that. And she was great. And she really let me run with it all. Although I'd sort of out of respect passed my stuff by her, made sure she was happy, or not obviously the director. Mm. And, and so, and that's how it was with that. And that's, that's the design process. And that's, I think, is very important to remember. And then the next thing is, you know, you're there also because the actor feels confident in your work and feels supported by you. So it's very important to maintain that and really maintain not just the makeup and hair being as great as you possibly can do it for them, as it would be for anything you're doing, but also to mm. support them and be there and emotionally support them if necessary, if it's a difficult role or hang out with them, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and because you're only looking after them, you have, you know, all this time, so you can really take care of them properly. You can really do everything you need to do. And so... The last thing that is important is that you really like that actor that you're the person of. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's a terrible grammar because you're spending all your time with them. And, you know, and so you need to like them a lot. You need to respect what they're doing. And then it, it's an absolute joy to mm. support an actor that you think is so fantastic. I, I just love Emma Thompson. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm so thrilled to work with her. She's such good fun and she takes it hair and makeup very seriously. And all the actors I've been personal to over the years, I've been unbelievably fond of and maintained a friendship with them. very friendly with Michelle still and Ben and all that lot. And I love working with them and they feel safe. And that's that's what you really need to do with actors is to make sure that they feel safe and that they feel that they look right for the character they're portraying. And that's what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with, yeah, being fond of the person that you're looking after. I mean, you don't want to be spending that many hours with somebody. <laughs> no, it's not fun. Uh, you know, <laughs> your mental health. But, it's a, you know, it's yeah, it's a joy to go into work every day because you're just like, oh, I love oh, it's working great. with this and, person. This is amazing. Yeah. yeah. And and also you have a relationship which is mutual, which is based on mutual respect because they mm-hmm. feel the same way about you. And so you have a great rapport. And there are very few actors that I don't re- that I don't like. I love actors, and I love being part of their process of creating characters. Yeah. So it's great when you have an actor who are great actors, yeah, and they request you. It's very flattering, and I I just feel great, very happy about that. Yeah, and, but I don't do it that often because, and often I say no, even if I really love them, because I like to design. An entire job, but I like to mix it up. Yeah, I like to design a whole film. And for instance, when I did Emma on Cruella, we just wrapped nineteen seventeen, which was a a massive job. Um, Yeah, incredibly rewarding in every possible way, creatively, emotionally. You know, it was just amazing. And but it was, I was a bit knackered. Um, And Emma said, "Would I do her?" And I said. Definitely. It's, it's great to design a massive movie and then do a film where you're just doing one person and so you're not necessarily on every day. So I said, sure, but when I said that, I hadn't read the script and I didn't realise she had 27 different looks. Oh! <laughs> so, in fact, it was quite a big deal, but so enjoyable. It was good. It couldn't have been more different. Oh, my goodness. Different, yeah, different ends of the spectrum. My goodness. Yeah. Yeah, so good. It was good. But it's so great to have that variety, as you say, like going from designing into personal, like it just keeps it interesting, yeah. doesn't it? It really does, yeah. And I, but I like to mix up. I like to do big films. I like to do very small films. I'd just done a Sally Potter film just before 1917, which uh-huh. the budget of that was smaller than my makeup budget in 1917, I think. Wow. <laughs> uh, but it was very intense and, and you know, cerebral and... So it was very different. So, And then I also do theatre, so, and so it, I really mix it up in that way too. That's amazing. So I, I feel like you're definitely in a, a time in your career where you can afford to kind of pick and choose what you'd like to do, like things that sing out to you, I suppose, more so than, oh, I need to take this job. It's more like, oh, that creatively sounds yeah. amazing or I love working with that cast. Yes, that sounds amazing. So that must be nice to be able to. Yes, it's fantastic. It's, yeah. It, it doesn't always work out, though, because sometimes you take a job and you think, oh, this is great, so exciting, and then it, it falls apart or it suddenly disappears or, crack, you know, whatever. Mm. And so there you are left in this huge gap when you thought you were shooting for six months and, you know, that happens occasionally. And then sometimes you do take something that maybe you're not and you don't desperately want to do, mm. but that, that doesn't happen so much anymore. It's true. It's true. It's, I do tend to be really excited about what I'm taking on, have a reason to take on the jobs that I do. It's either an emotional connection or a creative connection or, or so many different reasons that you take a job on there that's very cool so just going back and how you did that the first bond film with with timothy how quickly did things change for you after that immediately immediately i'd done that film i suddenly i suddenly got offered feature big feature films in the uk and it was a difficult time for us because a lot of us left the bbc at that point and it sort of started a big wave of us leaving going three months. And we all were trained to do hair and makeup together. Yeah. And in film, it was two separate jobs in the UK at that time. But we started, but the producers loved 
that we did hair and makeup because, well, first of all, they thought they were saving money, but they weren't really because you still have to employ the same amount of people. Yeah. So you bring two jobs on. But, but creatively, the directors liked it. They had one person designing everything from the neck up. But mm-hmm. it was a big problem because the unions didn't like it. And the unions were much stronger then. And the hairdressers were going berserk and they're desperately trying to stop us working. It was a difficult time. But they didn't That's succeed exactly. because they weren't quite, it's not like the US where the unions have really are powerful. And I mean, all the unions in the, in the States. And, and I can understand it. There's no way in the States you could do hair and makeup. You had to make a choice. And yeah. so I chose makeup when I lived there. But here, things changed quite rapidly. So after I finished Bond, I got offered lots of work. And we I bought all my guys, a lot of my friends who had left the BBC, came and worked, and Norma Webb, who I was not just at the BBC with, but also at college with, Mm. and work with me and is still working with me today yeah <laughs> that's so amazing I love those amazing. relationships yeah very strong relationship and very fantastic working relationship and also one of my best friends so yeah definitely one of my oldest friends that's so great yeah I I had no idea I don't know why I didn't know that about the UK was the that the hair and makeup was separated. Well, I didn't because, realize it changed, that. because it changed after we all left for B, it changed quite rapidly. Right. And you know, it's and it's still around. It's still that you you still do get people you still get films that are split. Batman's separate hair and makeup it tends to be the really, really big films. Yeah. Sometimes you have separate hair and makeup. Yeah. Uh, but it's very rare I do that now. It's nice on this yeah. because I'm working with a friend who's designing the hair so that's great that's all awesome. sorry sorry to hear but you know usually I, I would do prefer to do both yeah I mean I, I'm from New Zealand so I came up doing both and then moved to Los Angeles and was like yeah. well you have to make a decision and I was like oh, yeah I, uh, well, it's hard isn't it it's like do I have to make a decision <laughs> yeah. it's like well yeah if you want to get into the union and work on anything with a budget yeah so yeah it was very tricky and I went with hair because it was what I did straight out of high school Mm. and I was told by multiple people that I would get more work as a hairstylist than a makeup artist so but you probably do because there are less good hairstylists than good makeup artists I kind of lent lent that way I mean in the UK apparently that's the profession that is gonna we're going to be short of in the years to come because production is so big in the UK now. I mean, hopefully it will stay that way. And yeah, I've heard that worried it's about running out of money. They're really worried about it because there's so much going on. Do it's you not have money. a lot of trainees coming up at the moment? Yeah, we do. We, we have do. Do a good. lot of trainees. But, but you know, they're on to, and I think hair, people who are really well trained in hair, mm. it's hard to find, to find that. And... Mm. You know, that trainees were very hot on. I've done a lot of work with trainees lately. And it's, but it's hard. Somehow the makeup part of it is easier for them to get the training in than the, and the hair stuff isn't. And so, you know, I have trainees that I'm sending off to do cutting courses and wig dressing. And yeah. it's very hard to get that experience for them, particularly wigs. So I'm always telling them to go and get into a wig department uh, in, a, in the theatre because that's really great with training. Yeah. I've noticed the same thing in Los Angeles and there seems to be a lot of hairstylists who have worked, like come up working through Disney, like Disneyland. Yeah. And there's so much wig work there, even though they're a different different type of wig. They're yeah, not. It's a different, it's like, it's a different skill, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Not necessarily human hair and you know thicker lace and yeah. all that kind of stuff but they still get a really great foundation of yeah. you know everything from blocking it to styling it to putting it on and all that type of stuff and yeah and so you stuff. get a feel for it you get a feel for wigs when you're holding and handling them all yeah. the time and unless you go and get that type of experience it's very very hard and well you have to go into a crowd you have to go into crowd rooms on big period films and just keep working there to do feel confident and at the B we were lucky we had wig you know even at the London College of Fashion we had 
we had very extensive wig lessons and at the beep it carried on. So it's just that's how we got our training and it's very hard now. But we we do train people when they're in our department. We're giving lessons all the time. Yeah. To try and get them up to speed. But sometimes there isn't the time to really no. go to your trainings. You just have to somehow help them out during that time. Plus yeah. different films focus on different things. So in 1917, we had loads of people. It was a perfect place for them to practice barbering because we had th- literally thousands of soldiers. And I didn't want them to have very good haircuts because they didn't. And and because those barbers were going through hundreds, I mean, actually in the war, we're going through hundreds of soldiers at a time with mm-hmm. hand clippers, which don't, don't give you the finish that electric clippers do. Mm. Plus, they weren't that bothered at how great their haircuts were. They just wanted to get their hair off. So yeah. that was the perfect place for people to practice their barbering because I wanted them to look bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I could chuck all the trainees in and we could give them barbering lessons and not worry too much about the outcome. That's brilliant. <laughs> and it's the repetition too, isn't it, I find? Yeah. It's just like you really need to just do things over and over again. That's yeah, why I'm thankful do. that I had that time in the salon to just have yeah. client after client after client of just exactly. you know, doing it for yeah. That's exactly years right. on end. <laughs> yeah. <Well done. laughs> so tell me about some of these films that you've worked on because they're pretty exciting when I'm looking at your IMDb. Mm-hmm. Now, films like Zoolander and the Royal Tenenbaums and how, mm-hmm. how are things like this to work on? I imagine I'm going to just say well. fun. <laughs> Actually, well, they're tough because you have a, a huge, well, Zoomland, uh, mm. I, it's the first time I ever met Ben. So I just came off with Chocolat in France. I was living in New York and I flew out to meet Ben. I'd done a bit of research and he likes to see stuff. So I didn't know that. I just happened to have done quite a lot of tear sheets and fashion stuff and was getting some ideas together and, wow. and then I met him. And we met at some special effects place in the valley. And I literally, I flew there from New York and landed and went straight to see Ben. A bit knackered because I just landed from France recently, mm. like a couple of days before. And I walked in to see Ben and I just loved him. The minute I met him, mm. I just loved him. So I had a big connection with him. So it was fun. And he was very demanding in a good way. Demanding uh-huh. because he'd been working on this for so long, he knew exactly what he wanted. He knew what Derek should look like. And again, I wasn't doing hair. And then Dad Jerry was doing hair. Uh-huh. Uh, I was just doing makeup. But that was great because there was so much makeup. And Alan's very good at his really, he was at his peak when we did Zoolander. He designed that whole Zoolander hair and everything. It was really good. And the thing about, and we had, I mean, we were crying, loved to designing all that stuff. And then you had Will Farrell and all these people who you'd cry with laughter with anyway. But he looked ridiculous. <laughs> he absolutely. And, and that, so Alan decided to bleach his hair rather than use a wig. So we'd have to, he'd have to bleach and he burned his, his scalp and he's got darkish hair. And oh, mm. he bleached up to, I know, it was hysterical. And then we had to make, do things like make, a matching beard and moustache for his poodle, a little wig for the poodle to match the hair. And so that was all fine. But then Ben would go out at night after we wrap and go to the club and invite all the A-listers to come be in the film. So the next morning, all these people would stagger in, like Paris Hilton and God knows who, George <laughs> Michael, they just would stagger in. They'd been out all night and just come in. And we would, I just stand at my chair making up people. I had no idea who was coming in. I never could get to set. And I was looking after Ben as well. And they would just come pouring in night after day after day, all these people. And so it was quite exhausting to do that. But yeah. yes, it was really good fun because there are some amazing people in it, Justin Theroux, and and some amazing looks to create. Like that evil DJ it was hysterical. Yeah, and just so training. last minute, as you say. Like and pretty yeah, I mean he'd come in for a test and I go, What are you thinking? Oh and he'd give me all his reference, a bit of a gold tooth, and blah, blah, blah. I don't know if I actually slammed on some gold leaf or if I made him a gold tooth, I can't remember now. But it, <laughs> and Justin was so great. The, the actors were so lovely. 
Uh, and Ben's wife was in it. So it was all really nice. It was really a very memorable shoot. That's very <laughs> cool. And the Royal Tenenbaums, I went to see, you know, I got off at the Royal Tenenbaums and then I went to meet Wes Anderson, the director. Oh. And I went around to his flat and he'd drawn all of the characters. He'd done like a line drawing of each character. Oh, wow. And he said, this is how I want them all to look. And I said, do you want them to look exactly like this? I mean, it's literally one like, a line drawing. Oh. And then he went, yes. And I said, okay. So I went off. And in fact, I did design the hair on that because they didn't have a hairdresser on at that point and therefore everybody needed a wig. So I got all the wigs made at Peter Irons. Mm-hmm. where I always go for my wigs. And that's how it worked. I just really, I got given a drawing and I just reproduced it on the people. And even things like Gwyneth's eye makeup, she mm-hmm. had black eyes in that. She had black eyes as an adult, black smudgy, smoky eyes. Yeah. And the same as a child. She had the same eye makeup on. She always had it on. Yeah. And I can't remember if that was me or or if that was Wes designing that, but it was, it was probably Wes because it Everything on that screen, he designs the sets, wow. the costumes, everything. And so he definitely has a vision. Yeah, and that makeup on Gwyneth was a coal stick that I bought in Queens at the Indian market. And literally, it's like a pointy grease stick. Mm-hmm. And I would just slam it on and then I'd make her rub her eyes ah. and put on a bit of lip balm. And that was it. That was her makeup. She had no foundation, no nothing. Wow. Because she had this flawless skin. Yeah. And probably still does. And that was her makeup. And that's one of the biggest makeups I've ever done that people have commented on or copied. Or after that, everyone had black, smoky black eyes. And, and really, it was just a bit of old grease stick from Queens. That's <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Now, Cinderella looked like it must have been fun. Yes, that was fantastic. Because Big, beautiful, pretty, amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was. And Sandy Powell was doing the costumes and I hadn't worked with Sandy since we did a comic strip. Oh like, wow. The years before. We mm-hmm. both we both started at the same time and we met on a comic strip and we never met we hadn't met since. And Carol Hemming was doing the hair. Mm-hmm. And and we all had this idea all at the same time, which was to make Cinderella look like a film that had been made in the forties, a period film. Because in the forties and well in those days, whatever period you're in, the hair and makeup reflected the period in which it was shot. So you've got Gone with the Wind, yeah, which, which had a very, was it 40s, Gone with the Wind, it must have been, makeup. The makeup was all classic 40s and the hair was mm. sort of Victorian-y with a bit of a 40s feel. So we all said, why don't we do it? Because if we shot this in the 40s and you really give it some, a real look. And Ken went, for, Ken Browner, Kenneth Browner, the director, went for it. And that's what we did. So Sandy went really bright and really forties, and so did we. And Carol was doing sort of ringlets with a forties feel. And I just did straight forties makeups, but in very bright colours. And I did yeah. that on everyone. And the crowd was, we had a very big crowd. And we did that on everyone. We we made them all up weeks before we shot them. We did makeup tests on 500 crowd until they, I was very specific about them all and so we got them right. And that was the look of the film and it was very specific and it was really exciting to do. It was just because Carol Hemming, who did the hair, is absolutely a phenomenal hairdresser. Mm-hmm. She's really in, our, in a league on her own. And... And we work very well together with friends and we work very well together. And it was very exciting, actually, doing all of that. So did I just hear you correctly and say that you were able to, like, individually design each background? Yeah, we did. We did wow. that. And, and we we did that also on Spectre where we had 1,500 background. Wow. And, yeah, we, we do because it's a real luxury that you can yeah. get on a, ma- a major, huge budget movie. But everyone that came in for costume fittings, had hair and makeup fittings. So, and we did it for real. I do that most of my films, actually. And that was so brilliant. So we set the makeups and Carol and the hair was done. And then I would see them all. I'd either get, if we were on location, which we weren't, we're always in the studio, I'd see uh-huh. absolutely everybody and give notes. And I'm very specific. And But I work 
with, I tend to work with the same people who are very aware of what I like to see. So, and they know, they just know me really well. So we churned out all these extras in fittings. And so on the, it just makes it go really fast on the day because all the makeup's in there, it's all charted. Any specific makeup they have is all put in a bag with their charts so that when they come in on the day, it's how they have their bags, they have their makeup, and off they go to the makeup artist. And there's no wondering what's going on, what shall I do? Mm-hmm. It's photographed and you, it's done, and that's what you do. And so it makes the day go really quickly. The, the call, crowd call goes really fast, and you get what you want as well. Yeah. <laughs> Very exciting. And on to... I go and work in with the crowd when you've got big crowd calls. I like to go and work with them. And Absolutely. Oh. It's, it's just, I just love working with all those makeup artists. It makes me really happy. Oh, that's so nice to hear. That's awesome. I just love that. I'm so glad that it's still happening, that production haven't taken that time away from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fitting time. Yeah, exactly. Because I think it's... it's, it's uh, yeah, we did it. I'm good. When we did... When we did the opening sequence of Spectre, mm-hmm. we had and we had fifteen hundred extras in Day of the Dead makeup, and we had dance troops in very specific makeups, and and Nikita Ray was uh, was designing. Well, she was in charge of the crowd, and they were in Mexico City doing fittings. We were at Pinewood shooting main scene, and I'd sent her off with a mm-hmm. Bible of reference. And we talked and talked and we'd done tests before she went. So she knew sort of what we were after. And then I didn't want to take a huge amount of makeup artists from the UK. We sent five just because I knew them and that I knew that they could be in charge of teams and and sort of get what I wanted. And then we had Mexican makeup artists who were phenomenally good. I mean, mm. amazingly good. And then... We had street painters who were sort of just painting faces. And then we had body painters. We had airbrush people. And then we had people who were just good at arts that wanted to have a go because I wanted to mix it up. I didn't want it all looking flawless like makeup uh. artists that just attacked this crowd. And they prepped, prepped that for six weeks. It took them six weeks. And they we made it up every single person. And every day at Pinewood, at the end of the day, my phone would start exploding with WhatsApp pictures of all the fittings. Yeah, yeah. And I looked at every single makeup, 1,500 makeups. I looked at <clears throat> during those six weeks and gave notes, gave notes on them if necessary, but it wasn't really necessary because they nailed it really fast. Oh, that's so and brilliant. And then to see it all come together when you shoot it. Ah. I know. It's like, and then when I went out there and saw the setup, we had a setup because there were 150 makeup artists and 150 hairdressers. So there were 300 people in the stadium with makeup stations. And I walked in there and I walked in at four in the morning because I went to work with them. I was really bad. My work was just appalling because they've been doing it for six weeks. I came in cold. It's terrible. I did gobsmacking me bad. And but I was so overwhelmed at these people who were giving it their all, these makeup artists. We're just so committed to this. And we churned out that crowd in two hours. We found it in two hours. It was amazing. Wow. The must be some kind of record for that. <laughs> it's one of the great moments of my career. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, you've worked with beauty brands, right, to develop special edition lines and stuff that kind of coincide with the films that you've done. I think yeah. maybe did OPI do something with a nail color? Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Yes, no, I'm happy to talk about that. So OPI, Bond always have sort of marketing link-ups with various people, and they're approached by OPI to do a nail colour for Skyfall. And Berenice Marlowe, one of the Bond girls, well, we gave we gave her these incredible nails, and, that, and um, her hands were very featured in the film. So we gave her these really sculptured, beautiful nails, and... I designed a colour called Skyfall with OPI that reflected the colours in the casino, really. It was a deep brownie red that I were, I looked at all the colours and the colour swatches for the, for the set. Uh-huh. And I took it from that. And then I gold leafed the back of her nails because they were so uh-huh. long. 
I don't know if it's ever read on film, but we gold leaf the back and we painted the front. And and then they bought out this the nail color commercially called Skyfall. And it, and it was great. It was a great color. I still use it actually. Wow. Oh, that's so exciting. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love how you're going in and like figuring out what the colors of the set are and all of that type of stuff to incorporate it. Like that's a beautiful design work. I love it. Thank you. So I guess that goes into research, doesn't it? I was going to ask you how important do you think it is to spend time researching? It's hugely important and more over the last few years, actually. I don't, I suppose was the projects I'm in it, but I do a huge, huge amount of research because often you have to because they're historical, but even things like Cinderella where it wasn't based on any particular, where it's based on the sort of forgery feel. I still did a ton of research, really a ton, just to get ideas. You get so many ideas from just looking through stuff and all the time I've got a very big library at home of books that I use for reference. Mm -hmm. And I've collected over the years and I just always buy or I see someone else's if I'm at work and I'll buy those or, you know, I just keep buying books. And obviously now most of the research you can do online is pretty good. You can do anything online, really. There's everything there. Yeah. And I find myself I, I, going back to books, though. Yeah. I just, I love, I love shipping through all my books. I just, I pull out all the books that I think might be relevant and then, and then go through them all. And you now, obviously, every time we do a film, we've got another 20 of books. So <laughs> I run out of bookshelves. But, it keeps growing and growing. Yeah. But I know I like to do books. I like to go to galleries. I go to museums. I go. In 1917, we were, we were at the Imperial War Museum mm-hmm. at the time and grabbing documentary footage. I bought loads of documentaries. And in fact, we ran them when we were getting the crowd ready. We would run. We had TVs. I made. I asked production to put TV screens up in the crowd room, and we ran documentary footage all the time on a loop, so that they there was. It was for two reasons. Firstly, so that the makeup artists could look up at any time if they got stuck for an idea, mm. and for for these haircuts, and look up and see someone immediately. As well as you know, in that in that crowd room, we had thousands of pictures on the wall, thousands. And mm. but it was really useful having running the documentaries because then real people move on. And it also helped the um, supporting actors because they could look at the soldiers that they were portraying all the time. They were up there and and uh, it really was helpful. Really helpful. Yeah. Just helps people get into that groove, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, really does. You know. That's awesome. I was going to talk to you briefly about the continuity situation on 1917 as well, because I yeah. imagine that was, I mean, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't as bad. I you know people always ask me that question. And um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't as difficult as, as it would appear to be because we shot mostly in sequence. Okay. And we had a massive amount of prep time. We had as much prep time as we as it took to shoot the film. We had sixteen weeks of prep. I had sixteen weeks of prep. Yeah. And we shot over fifteen weeks. But the prep was so incredibly well organized by the production. It was an incredibly collaborative crew. We all were working at it at Shepperson and all our, everyone had open doors and we were all in and out of each other's departments. And it was the most collaborative and happy experience I've ever had on a film. Wow. Because of the nature of the film, everything overlapped. So I worked a lot with set dressing because we had barbed wire fences in no man's land. We had bodies hanging off them. And then, and because the shots were so well designed months ahead of when we ever shot them, Sam could go, well, we're taking the camera through no man's land and we're passing this and that and these bodies here and those bodies there. He knew exactly how many Mm. bodies we needed months before we ever had to shoot them. Wow. And then he'd go, and then we're going through some barbed wire and I want a piece of hair hanging off the barbed wire at this particular point. I mean, this is... Christmas time, and we didn't shoot till whenever it was, April. And um, that's how detailed our knowledge was. We were involved 
in all the blocking rehearsals. We knew what was going on. And, and so continuity wasn't so bad because I knew what every shot was. We knew way ahead of time where the fades were, where the blends were, I mean, where each shot blended into another. Mm-hmm. And we had a lot of equipment to help us. So, you know, apart from our usual continuity photos, we had huge screens that everyone was watching so that we we had the image up that we were matching to always. So oh wow. It was right. we're in very high quality. Yeah. And we had everyone watching. We had very, very conscientious script supervisor. And and I had Rebecca Cole who was doing who was doing George Mackay, mm-hmm. who was the lead. Yeah. Is completely anal. And she, brilliant. <laughs> she is beyond anal. She yeah. knows I say this about her. And that's why she got that job, because yeah. I knew that, that not one fleck of dirt was going to be wrong in the wrong place. And George was the hardest. And because we were in sequence, we knew what was going to happen to them. We uh, Things happened in real time and we kept it. And because it was one shot, so you're shooting mm. them, you're going through no man's land, falling over, getting covered in mud. That was the shot. Yeah. And... We had usually had three shots that Sam would like, and we could match all of those together. But it, it wasn't that hard. The only hard thing, did you? I don't know if you saw the film or not. Yeah, no, absolutely. But there's a sequence. There's a scene where George McCarthy gets mm-hmm. buried in chalk. Mm-hmm. Where they're in the German bunker. There's an explosion. There's a lot of chalk dust, and he's completely buried. And that was our weather cover. So that was the only shot that was weather cover that was out of sequence and it was the shot that had the most effect on how he was going to look yeah and from that before we ever shot that sequence we had them coming out of that of that bunker oh into the air and that we hadn't shot the sequence so that was a ch- very challenging moment for us but what happened was because everyone was so prepped we prepped mm. it by recreating we went into the set in the studio where they built the set and we did mm. the explosion and we buried George for real. And then we pulled him out and we photographed the end result. So we knew exactly what was going to happen. And you don't always get that opportunity. But because oh, absolutely not. So wow. Prepared, yeah. We do it. So we photographed that. And we had that as a reference for him for coming out of the scene months before we ever shot the explosion on the bunker. Yeah. So, you oh. know, that's... That's what happens when you have a director who knows what they want and also a very collaborative crew. It's, yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah, it really is. It's amazing. So throughout your career, I imagine you've worked in a few locations around the world. Let me ask you, do you have any favourites? Well, memories. I suppose, well, I mean, all the major cities, Rome, Paris and all of that. Look, but I, I, I love Mexico. I just love working in Mexico. And we shot a Bond film. We based it out of Cherubusco, which in the studios in Mexico City. I don't think they're there anymore. Mm. And I just love it in Mexico. I, I love the colours and the people and the art and the buildings. And and I love that. And I also love Morocco. Oh, nice. Love shooting in Morocco. Just love mm-hmm. it. Just think it's the most beautiful place. Again, great people. The smells. It's dead sexy Morocco. <laughs> but... You know, I've also I also love the Highlands, and, but I suppose those are my favourites. Yeah, and what has been um, one of the more challenging locations you've shot in? Well, I think going through no man's land and mm. going through these massive cr- craters filled with water and working in that mud for a quite a long period of time that was challenging. I think that was probably one of the most challenging locations. But I, I also think we shot. Spectre in the desert in Morocco. It was somewhere 40, uh, 42 degrees. It was incredibly hot. That was difficult. The pouring of the sweat. It's any location that has extreme weather conditions that affects the look, at, that affects the actor and how they look, and that you have to maintain them and fight that all the time. Yeah. It, I think heat is worse than cold for that. Yeah. So, you know, really extreme desert conditions are very challenging, I think. Absolutely. And for all your products and everything as well, I would imagine. I mean, hot yeah. or cold, it's kind of yeah. like 
<laughs> to the <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just can't win. <laughs> so what is your approach when it comes to caring for your cast's skin? Like especially if you're on a six month job and there's someone that's coming in every day. I, I like to take really take care of their skin because I don't like to put a lot of makeup on people. So particularly men. So we give them very regular facials. We cleanse them really thoroughly at the end of the day. We have hot towel machines. We do really good cleansing. We have products, masks. We spend a lot of time taking care of actor skin. We yeah. really do. I think that's a good way to look at it is that you're doing it for the reason of not wanting to have to cover their skin, that you want to yeah. have their skin come through and yeah. not put so much makeup on. I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I did want to ask you, when you're putting a team together, what are you looking for in people? Well, what I'm looking for is a, is a passionate commitment to the project, really. But the people I work with, I've worked with, many, many times, and, and they all have different skills. They're all good at different things. So, like, Rebecca is incredibly fastidious. But what I what I also am looking for is, is a very big respect for actors, and I think actors really need to be taken care of because I think to be an actor, to be a really good actor, you have to be incredibly brave and willing to expose yourself completely mm -hmm. and I think that takes a lot of courage and I think we need to be there for them to take yeah. care of them both emotionally and physically or just even just physically take care of them gives them that security of being able to go out and do their job and and so that's why I'm looking for that type of commitment and respect for actors as a profession because lots of people don't respect actors enough I think and I think it's really important but, you know, and also I want them, obviously, to be as well-trained as they possibly can be mm -hmm. and fun and nice and kind yeah, and all of those things because it sort of gets a bit wild in my makeup sometimes. <laughs> and so it's sort of in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> but, I was say. But they, need to be, <laughs> they need to be able to sort of go with that flow, and they do. They're really great, and they're very loyal to me. It's, I suppose loyalty to me isn't something that I look for because mm. that takes time to build, and it's not something I, I demand, but I just find that people are so so supportive of me, and that's why I suppose I use the same people over and over again because we're really like a family and we support each other. I love my crew. They're very, very important to me. And they really are like a family, truly are. And, and I just miss them when I don't see them, if we have breaks or anything. I really miss them. And that's how it is. But I also do have new people coming all the time. And, you know, I'm always looking for makeup artists. I'm desperately trying to increase diversity within the makeup department on feature films, desperately trying to make it more diverse. And so I'm really trying to deal with that as well at the trainee level. So if I'm lecturing, sometimes I do talks hmm. or, or I do some some training things and I'm always demanding that the people I'm, I'm addressing, have there has to be diversity in every way. That's brilliant. So hopefully we'll get better at that. Yeah, I love it. We'll make sure we get better at that. Yeah. I agree. So now because we are always learning in our line of work, what is something that you've learned recently that you thought was exciting or just plain helpful? That's a bit of a question. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'll tell you what, though. I work, I don't know if it's something or I work with various prosthetic people. I've worked with Tristan Best Luis a lot on 1970 and on Black Mamba. Mm -hmm. But I'm also I also work with Mike Marino from New York and mm -hmm. always learning stuff from him. And I don't know what right now, but he's so out there. He's so brilliant that he's always coming up with stuff. But you know, it was interesting working with Nadia Stacy on mm -hmm. Cruella. I was very interested in how she works. And she works, she does a huge amount of research, tons. And she gets a lot of inspiration from that. And then she calls in 
people who are very specifically good, who are good at very specific things. And if that was something I learned from Nadia was to really choose people. It doesn't matter if you can't be good at everything. This is what I is to accept the fact that you cannot be good at every single thing within your craft. Like right. you're not going to be as good as at prosthetics as Mike Marino or Tristan or because I don't do it all the time. I'm good at different things. Hmm. And I'm watching Nadia working. I I I realised that it's okay to not be good at everything. Not that she isn't good at. This is going to come out wrong. I but think I, I understand what you're saying. A lot of a lot of um, designers or heads of departments will will bring people in for specific jobs. Yeah, I mean, you like, can't do everything, even no, you though can't. you could actually do it. But physically, with time and scheduling, and it's just not possible. So, mm. yeah, I completely it's, understand what you're yeah, saying. It's true, and you can't be. And I, when we did Synexiki New York, Charlie Kaufman's film. We had to have a full body tattoo, and I wanted it hand painted. I had it designed by. I went to a tattoo gallery, and then and he designed it and made all the transfers. And then I brought in an artist to actually paint it. It took two days to paint this body, but I wanted a particular painterly effect, and I knew that I wouldn't be as good at, at that as an artist, a fine artist would be. And that's who we yeah. were bringing in as fine artists. So. It's that. It's just knowing. It's not having limitations, but not right. having limitations and accepting that you need other people to help you fulfil that. I yeah. think that's something I've learned. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, what one tool or product would you never want to work without? That's such, such a hard question. question. I know, and nobody can give me one answer, so don't worry. <laughs> because there isn't really ever going to be an answer to that question. Because if you don't have the product, you can't work without. You're going to find a way to use some other product to make it work. Well, that's a good answer. So there we are. And I think that's what artists have to do all the time. So you've got to make yeah. it work. It is. It's, it is what we have to do. And it's not an excuse of I don't have that. It's no figure it's, it out. <laughs> yeah, it's all you're on set and you've forgotten the one thing you need. You know? Yeah. And so you have to fish around in your set page to find something else that will do that. You know, I'll quickly mix the colour or do something because... There's always a way. That's what I think. I agree. That's an awesome answer. <laughs> and who would you like to hear on the podcast? I think I'd like to hear Mike Marino on the podcast. I agree, actually. Yeah. That's, yeah. Not only because he's, he's a phenomenal prosthetic makeup artist, he's also a phenomenal artist and he's mm-hmm. a, great, a great personality and dead cute. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, he's a lovely guy. <laughs> that's awesome okay <laughs> well thank you Naomi what a fantastic time I've had getting to know you well it's been a pleasure it's been lovely chatting to you Ah, <sighs> are you tired of having sore shoulders neck and a bad back are you fed up with clutching actor bags under your armpits whilst doing your last looks on set And what about those frustrating moments rummaging through an overfilled shoulder bag? Sound familiar? We have the comfortable, practical, and slick solution for you. Linear Standby Belts manufactures customizable tool belts designed for hair and makeup artists by a hair and makeup artist, Georgia Lockhart Adams. It consists of a high-quality padded belt and 12 interchangeable accessories and pouches, which will hold all your onset needs. With a hand Velcro top on all pouches, you can swap out and change bags quickly. Even hand over actor bags to your colleagues if you step away from set. Work with both hands free and with all your essentials within easy reach. It is a game changer and will make your long working day easier. Come along and join the LSB revolution. Why wait? Visit LinearBelts.com to order your customizable tool belt today. Okay, Last Looks crew, thanks for listening. And remember, if you love it, share it. A quick scroll down and you'll find our show notes. Or maybe you'd like to give your support and leave a five-star review. Go on, I know you want to. 
Search The Last Dogs Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, or TikTok, whichever one tickles your fancy. And a massive shout out to the husband, Brett Stanley. Without his patience and tech support, this whole podcast situation simply does not happen. And cheers to Liliana Rose for her fabulous voice acting talents. Okay, Last Looks crew, that's a wrap for me. I don't need to be told twice to get out of here. So bye. I'll catch you on the flip side. That's a wrap, people.